straight out of the block, may the force be with you Yeah, on May the 4th. Anyway, so welcome to the round table. We're going to talk about data centres and their development in the future, edge data centres, what's driving the edge, whether it be inner or outer, I'm not sure. We'll talk about that hyperscale. And we'll look at the impact on what the future demands from data centres means in terms of the design, both the internal and external, maybe even locations as well, energy cost, etc., etc. So we've got uh, four basic uh, parts we're going to talk about. New technologies that are driving the change. Um, what does this actually mean for the data centre? Um, how are the two of those interactive parts, the edge and the hyperscale, and what, what will come in between, if anything? I think something will come in between, but we don't know what yet exactly. Um, and um, then the impact having on the design requirements for the components in the data centre, but probably centering around power, but we should also mention cooling as far as locations probably concerned as we go through. So, um, kicking off, um, let's talk about the new technologies that are driving data centre design. Is that technologies or is that applications? Geraint. Uh, more applications, you know, drive the technologies. Uh, I think um, the biggest change we see at the moment is a lot of discussion about you know, Internet of Things, 5G, smart cities. But to me, those are all uh, coming. The stage we're at at the moment, the next three or four years, is um, re-architecting the current networks and data centres to, to prepare for that. So the activity we're seeing at the moment is what telcos would call cord, uh, central uh, re-architecting of telecom sites into data centres and then of the edge build-out um, by all sorts of companies, content and telecom, uh, in order to prepare to uh, roll out the new applications which we all talk about, like the Internet of Things and mm. smart cities. So it's four years of preparation before the new applications you are don't, you, don't, you don't think we're already, we're already there? No. Oh, that's interesting. Um, Michael, have you got a, a, an opinion on that? No, I, I don't think we are there either. Uh, I think it's still at least uh, we have to wait until 2022 before we reach the 5G build out and uh, come closer to the edge. Common misunderstanding is that the edge means the network edge. It, it doesn't, it means the content edge. So it's all about where do you roll application, computer processing and storage to and the, the edge uh, of the boundary of the computing and how close to the subscriber or the user that is. And when you're looking at the network hierarchy, you have to choose where you wish your content edge to be. And the content edge may be at a different location than the network edge. And one of the big debates we have every week with customers is, you know, is the content edge going to go right out to the network edge? And what is the edge of a network? Or is it actually going to be uh, an inner edge, an outer edge? The inner edge is where the content services many applications. Uh, the outer edge tends to be much more application specific. So for example, in a, you know, a town or a city, you might ha you will have an edge of where the content goes to. But once you get into particular applications like digital television, uh, they'll, in each village, each suburb, each street, there'll be an outer edge where that application applies. But if you're not delivering digital television to that street, then you won't have that outer edge but you'll still have an inner edge where all the content from the web and the streaming uh, is stored. So it's about where the computing and storage goes, not where the network goes. As each generation of you know, ICT has rolled out for the last 40 years, uh, for financial reasons as much as anything, you always start with content at the center that is long lined out to the user over whatever infrastructure you've got. And then there comes a point when the sheer volume of traffic increases so you have to put some intermediate controls in. And what we're seeing now is, you know, the edge is um, a, a, a control of, of content and storage of content near the edge. And the cord, as the telcos call it, is really the intermediate layer. So as the traffic builds up, you cannot long haul all that traffic and give good latency, good performance, or the users switch off. So you have to start putting in an intermediate layer and then an, an, and then an edge layer. And then ultimately, to your point, you'll, you'll end up having an outer edge where you have a street side cabinet or you'll have a single uh, rack doing computing in a hotel room, for example. That'll come, but there's a gradual build up of a pyramid structure and a rollout of layers. And what we're seeing at the moment for the next four years is uh, all over the world actually is designs and plans to roll out the intermediate and the edge layers 
to, um, and without that, there isn't a belief that uh, Internet of Things and 5G will work effectively because there's too much traffic being long hauled from you know, handsets, smartphones, mm. all the way back to data centers, which again, as you said, could be in any country, you know, wherever they are. So there's a need to roll out these intermediate infrastructure in given, preparation. Uh, given the current, yeah. given, yes, you certainly can. I think also, I mean, the 5G build-out and the new applications that we will uh, uh, work with in, in that network, that will require uh, a lot of uh, low latency uh, data centers for self-driving cars, for instance. I mean, you can't work with that and having uh, a long latency. So, so I, I guess the new applications that is coming will also define the new edge and that's why we say that this will start 2022 when the uh, 5G rollout will uh, begin. Yeah, I hope that uh, automatic car, uh, guided cars, self-driving self cars, I hope that they're not controlled by the edge. I hope they're controlled by GPS on board the car. But it could, because the, you know, the, side, the type of hardware that people are rolling out is not our traditional uh, ultra-reliable, resilient. So you've been driving down the street, if the local lamppost, which has got your local edge in it, edge edge, outer edge, uh, yeah. fails, you don't want the car just to go straight on, do you? You want to stop. But I think also, I mean, how you build up uh, these new networks, I mean, with, uh, that they are talking about self-healing networks. So, so, I mean, for redundancy and for, for safety, they will look different. So you hope that the next lamppost is close enough. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but but to, to Garen's point, what do you think about the fact that, uh, well, if I said to you, I'm not sure this is true actually, but let's, let's test you out on it. If I said to you that the edge will be rolled out only by telcos? No, I don't think so. And uh, that's actually one big debate that we have. Who, who will own the, 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 the edge? And uh, the telcos could be someone, uh, but also maybe some, someone else. So, so we see some, some rapid changes in the, in the market around the, the, uh, the, uh, the data centers. And maybe, I mean, co-location operators today we will change in also to uh, owning some parts of the edge. So this is still an open question. Yeah, and you've got, so you've got telcos and you've got uh, tower companies in many parts of the world may take over that. The colos will convert and adapt to be edge in particular towns and cities. Uh, so that's the core transition going on at the moment. And then you've got the threat that the content providers themselves will get frustrated with the speed of that. It's too slow for them. And so the content providers will roll out their own edge in competition and just wholesale the bandwidth. So, so when we're rolling out uh, a new infrastructure like an edge, we have to make a choice with the customers as to what sort of applications they're rolling out because that determines the type of data centers, the type of cord, the type of edge, inner or outer, that they'll need. So it is very application uh, driven, which means the customers have to think through their business cases, where they're gonna make the money to drive their investments and not do it just because everybody else is doing it, do it because your applications make you money. Mm. I see that's an interesting point. If you think of the edge, especially the, uh, what you call the outer edge, uh, the decision at that point will be made to, as to whether the communication that it's carrying out can be batch processed or not. Yes. So we'll go back, to, we'll go back 40 years to batch processing again so we can say, well, we'll do that and report it later when the, when the network's not so busy. Yeah, how is yeah, the storage architected? You know, is it in batches, is it uploaded, downloaded? Is it real time? What size of batches are required? Is it, is it a very important part of IT design now, and that's changed. So the question is, what's going to kick off that exponential growth again? And that could be the Internet of Things and the smart everything. I think it could. And you asked about the size. And I, I can see that we have discussions today with customers talking about the edge in terms of something that could be half a rack, uh, maybe five kilowatts, yeah, and then going up to maybe a couple of hundreds kilowatts. So depending on the application and where it is in the world, that will differ. And if it's inside a city or outside the, uh, a, uh, a uh, urban area, so, so, so that's uh, yeah. Yeah, the half a rack is what it, it's in my mind. Yeah. The half a rack, five kilowatts, uh, maybe even liquid cooled, which we'll come on to maybe later. But uh, mm. yeah, it's an interesting point. I, I think we see a very different buying behaviour and then end result in the enterprise and service provider markets. So in the enterprise market, we see people trying to guess what capacity they'll need for the next five years. 
And then, as you said, they often overguess, they, 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 and then they realise they don't need quite so much. And, they, and, and the IT guys are always working on efficiency, and, and the efficiency and the amount used comes down, and then they have space left. Whereas in the service provider community, um, it's very much a pay-as-you-grow. So they start with a minimum amount. They use modular architectures, and they grow. And, and if anything, we've seen them underestimate the scale of growth uh, in, in the last decade and around the world. So what we actually see in the service provider communities is accelerating growth and um, the need to get more capacity all the time. If we look specifically at uh, the two extremes, the edge and the hyperscale, maybe what's coming in the middle, how's that going to actually impact the data center as we know it today? Well, I mean, if we look back, uh, I can see if, uh, based on my own experience that Somewhere around 2013, the, the mid-sized data centers uh, started to decline, which meant that a lot of enterprises that were, were mid-size went into co-location instead. And uh, just before that, we also started uh, to have the discussion around uh, cloud. And cloud was meant to be, or, or a lot of people thought that that, that was the answer to, to everything. Uh, which wasn't true, of course. But no one, no one really understood at that time that cloud is just someone else's data center. Exactly. So now we have these giant data centers and we have the co-location data centers, which, was, which is also quite big. And then we have smaller companies having their own uh, premises, of course. So, so um, with all these new technologies and these new applications that we are developing for, for uh, Internet of Things and self-driving cars, there is a need for something in between, and that will be uh, the uh, edge data centers. And this year has actually been uh, named by some organization that this will be the race or, or the rise of an uh, edge data center. Yeah, we have to remember the role of Delta and LTEC it is not to you know, choose which business cases are successful. It's for our customers to do that. Our, our role is to facilitate for them the ability to exploit their business case and deliver it and to do it in an optimal way and to give them our best experience and our advice of what works, what type of uh, solution infrastructure applies if that's their business case, you know, so they're going for the high performance, hyperscale, blockchain type world, or if they're going for the mainstream market, IoT, 5G, here's the type of infrastructure you need. And our role is to deliver for both. It's not for us to decide who's successful or not. We will, we will help our customers achieve their business. You should never go horse racing and bet on yes. just on the favorite. No, yeah. absolutely. Well, each way I, mean, I have also seen uh, customers getting more, more data for each year, uh, but still. Some do, yeah. Some do. And uh, again, I mean, there is not, I mean, one solution for everyone. So, so it's about being ready for the future and being able to adapt to it. We, you know, we, we, make, we make technology extremely modular now. We make it extremely scalable. We try to make sure that the same architecture is deployed for the smaller site as deployed for the biggest. And that's not been done historically. You know, you, you move from one technology to another. So that if it succeeds, you can have as much of it as you need. And if it doesn't succeed, your, your upfront investment is quite small. And that's a cultural thing, but that moves into our design thinking, our engineering. And then we have to alter our factories to produce technology according to those principles. So that's the fundamental change going on at the moment. You know, we're re-architecting our factories globally to produce technology that you can have a small amount of or a vast amount of in a consistent way globally, uh, depending on how successful you are at defining your own business case. Hedging your bets. Hedging your bets for the customer, not telling them what's right. So Mikhail, one, one point I'd like you to clarify for me. The idea that uh, Geraint uh, gave of the, the chain, the flow of the chain from the hyperscale all the way down to the inner and outer edge, if you want to, to describe those two things separately. Do you think there's any pieces of that chain that will disappear? You know, it, you know some people, you, you hear them talk about it'll just be the edge and the hyperscale. Yeah. I think we will have a, I mean, there will be a hybrid, of course. I mean, no one or very few can use only one of these. So, so a hybrid will, for a forcible future, be, be, be uh, one, one option. Uh, at the same time, every, I mean, the, the, the industry and the market is trying to uh, get more and more efficient. So the ones that can get better efficiency will also be, be the ones that grow in the future. So, so I think the hyperscale will still be, be uh, very important. So what will happen with uh, the other one down below there, 
I'm not really sure, no. but in hybrid for sure. We've, we've certainly seen both experiences. So, we, you know, we, you know, mass, massive number of telecom customers and then also the big hyperscale customers. And so there's a content community that thinks you grow the hyperscale and you feed an edge and you, you, you get rid of the intermediate levels. Mm -hmm. But there's a telecom community that has you know, a hierarchy of levels that thinks it's better to upgrade that and, and do a and, period. And owns the network. And owns the network. So the and, interesting and, thing that you didn't mention was the fact that you need a network for the hybrid, you need a hybrid network. Yeah. You need some of the network that can that can push content down below, and you need some of the network that can say, "No, I'll just have high-speed communication back to the hyperscale." So uh, we're talking about hybrid networks as well as hybrid data centers and hybrid customers and hybrid edge. And I think I think the biggest impact that there is that we have a decade of massive change going. We're, we're going to have another explosion of change this next decade. Uh, there's demand all over the world from all sorts of companies to do all sorts of things. No one quite knows who's going to succeed, other than there will be change and there'll be huge growth. Uh, there'll be winners, there'll be losers. So what it does mean for us, though, is that we have to simplify the transition process. So we spend our time looking at uh, exactly what technology is required. Are there intermediate layers you can strip out? How do you make things easier to manufacture? How do you deliver all over the world? How do you support, install, and maintain reliably all over the world. Yes, so we're going to go a decade of digital revolution. It's well underway and we have to make it facilitate that as best we can. And that's what our focus is. Um, and, and the scale of the chain, you know, shouldn't be underestimated. And um, we're already in a situation where uh, there's exponential growth, there's capacity shortages. It's the 80s since we, we had global shortages in components and capacity. But that's the new world because everybody is trying to transition at the same time. And we have a fundamentally step change, uh, a digital revolution, if you like, in the next 10 years. And there'll be winners and losers through that. So we spend our time trying to make sure all the applications are serviced. We make the manufacturing as simple as we can. We take out in the intermediate layer, layer, layers. We make it as modular and scalable as we can. Um, and we supply it to any geography, be it, you know, 3 kilowatts or 300 megawatts. It's the same approach all over the world. And that's what's required to deliver the scalar transition. We've had to double our factory output capacity, ready for it, and we'll probably have to double it again. Um, we have to globalize, and we have to increase our local presence, because you know, reasons you mentioned previously about serviceability, uh, working you know, with the independent marketplace as well as our own people, to give, uh, because of the, the scale of deployment required for all these applications, Internet of Things, 5G, uh, Cord, Edge, is vast and it's barely begun and that's the biggest issue for the industry how do you scale up on such a vast scale in every country to all these wide range of applications in the space of 10 years so does that in, in, does that impact in the sort of design equipment that you're thinking of let's think of power just power the ac or dc power do you think in the future it's going to have to be more reliable because there's going to be many, many more smaller installations? Does the equipment itself has to be more reliable, self-healing, self-diagnostic? Already today, I mean, where we go with a uh, solution, we always take the very site into consideration. So the country or, I mean, where we're going and how are the customer going to be able to uh, maintain that afterwards? So, so, so that's, that's part of uh, the design process, actually. We, we do see a change, though, because in the enterprise uh, co-location data centers where traditional IT is supported, um, tech power, you know, we supply uh, AC-based power solutions. But for the reasons you just mentioned, in the industrialized applications which are involved in that, you know, hyperscale, blockchain, telecoms, internet, uh, what, uh, we're using uh, direct current, DC power. You know, and people you know, often make me smile when they say there's no direct current out there. You know, we've supplied a thousand megawatts of direct current power in the last two years. Um, but the rollout uh, has been uh, of lower voltage, 48 volt computing has been the big change. Um, so, so, there's so, a, so it's AC to the rack and then DC racks? Uh, yes, or it's DC and DC, but it's certainly those are the two options. And currently AC through the distribution and then DC uh, to the compute is, a, is the big change. But the point about that is it's, it's looking for ways to simplify and 
the technology and the manufacturing to enable a big rollout to many locations. So all the industrialized applications, the smart cities, the utility stuff, um, and the, the, the blockchain and the hyperscale is simplifying back to direct current. And there's a massive rollout, silent revolution, I call it, going on in those sort of applications. It's silent because no one else has heard of it. Exactly, yeah. And those guys, and, and, and for those guys, they don't, you know, it's in their commercial interest to do the rollout and then tell people afterwards. Um, so it, it is going on, it's at a massive scale. So we're seeing the simplification of the technologies going on to in order a massive scaling up of the amount of the technology. Um, and you know we deal with the consequence of all those things. You know it's not it's not uh, we, we do our best, but it's not for us to control business cases or relative wealth and how countries organise themselves. But the sum effect of the growth factors exceeds the efficiency gains that you rightly pointed out, because we see uh, the the capacity required that we have to manufacture going up exponentially. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's the problem. I think that, that, that we we get we get the, the the end of the argument. We don't get involved in the the first part of the argument. So people get told we're going to have a five kilowatt rack, but we at the, at the data center end never get involved in the discussion of what that five kilowatts actually doing. We just assume that's the, that's the that's the uh, you know the holy cow. That's the elephant in the room. That's what we mustn't ever criticize. That's why PUE was invented to take the focus off of the one. As we transition from this um, non-edge uh, uh, reality to the edge future, do you really think that um, latency is going to become an issue? Or, or has, the, has the, the increase in capacity of fiber and even copper gone up to the stage now where latency will never be a problem? I think latency will be a problem for some applications. Uh, I think we, came to a point for a lot of the things that we're using uh, every day where it's good enough, uh, at least in some parts of the world. Uh, but for some applications it will be a problem and the, one of the challenges is that we don't really know today what we will have tomorrow. So, so there is a constant uh, development and it's going quite rapid. Uh, so, so, yeah. Capacity is a problem already. So it's not uh, well, it's it, because, because, it's we're, because we're using we're, we're capacity is a problem at the moment because we we're still using up the stuff we installed in the you know the early two thousands that was the dark fiber that was there that was never used it's almost deteriorating now but you know when you when you get look at cabling today you can have one gigabit per second ten forty a hundred and there's a usually a, a constant uh, upgrade path from one to a hundred so it's a hundred times the speed of fiber of speeds which you could never dream about and you remember the old 64k modem yeah 64k yeah. modem you know with a little beepy sound when it dialed up um, we're, we're, we're light years literally light years ahead of that with optical fiber but that's uh, an interesting it's an but interesting still, point distance for, for these solutions I mean you, I mean, you can't go faster than, than light. So, no, apparently. Yeah. So latency will be a problem for some applications. Yeah. We've established that there's, a, that there's a, going to be a hybrid future of inner edge, outer edge, middle, middle facilities, all driven by content. Yeah, more so, and then latency. So content and latency has always been an issue and always will be an issue. We've probably agreed that there'll be lots of different size power solutions as you go up the, the chain, as you called it, from the, from the outer edge all the way up to hyperscale. So the question is, uh, in that chain, how are we going to see uh, data centers built and constructed? Of, and when I, when I say data centers, I mean everything from you know, one cabinet, which is a data center and it's got power cooling and uh, compute and storage in it, um, all the way up to hyper chain, hyperscale. So, how do you, Mike, Michael? How do you see uh, the, the what are the important issues for future data centers? I think most of the customers that we speak with, I mean, what they need is to have a solution that they can rely on today, but also grow with in the future. So, a modular approach for for, for any kind of data center is uh, desired. Uh, however, I mean, you also have to. I mean, make the frame uh, and uh, decide where you want to go. But we use the modular approach in uh, most of the uh, discussions that we have today. Mm. Oh, I see that. I see that too. I mean, 
people not wanting to spend all the capex up front and and uh, put it off till when the customers arrive. I also see a lot of people finding out that they're designing for certain cabinet densities and then the customers don't arrive and they can actually use some of that infrastructure for the next phase. Yes. One of the other things we've done is um, we've we stripped the power products down to match the IT products more closely. So what that actually means, we have a family of in inverters and rectifiers that do the different voltages the new applications re require because there's quite a wide variety of voltages used. Um, and you are more on a one-to-one -one ratio with the servers and the switches on the IT side. Um, so we have a minimal kilowatt unit and then we can scale that up to megawatts and tens of megawatts and even hundreds of megawatts. Um, so that's what we mean by modular. Then the issue then is how you divide the systems up and the control between them. So we, we work with customers on that. Um, but it means we can match the density of the power and the cooling solution to the density of the IT, to the density of the application at each location. But the manufacturing process, the delivery process, the support and the maintenance process is simplified and consistent in all locations. And that's what makes it easy. It's all about making it easy for our customers to deliver their infrastructure and look after it. You've mentioned the, the idea of the flexibility, yeah. uh, and that obviously is a great help for customers who are capex constrained, they don't want to spend all their money at once. Um, what about the speed of deployment? Do you think that you know p people make decisions later, which means they have to have delivery faster? or? So that's a little bit different, or uh, for, for it, it, different customers have uh, different needs, and for some customers speed is very important. So, so that's also why we, I mean, we are working with the traditional uh, approach with the traditional uh, 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 brick and mortar solutions, but we're also working with prefabricated data centers. Mm -hmm. so, so that could be everything from a small one with everything uh, in one uh, box, so to say, or a large data center that could be several thousand square meters made and by, two by yeah, modules. Yeah. Yeah. And that uh, the, the prefabricated approach actually can cut uh, up to like 50% of the, the product plan out if you compare prefab and traditional ones because you can build the foundation at the same time as you make the house with all the installations. So when speed is a need, prefab is uh, one of the answers. But we also have other options where, where we, we, we supply um, like power modules or cooling modules to, to customers uh, that build like large uh, so co-location centers. Rooms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you find when you do the, the modular, uh, modular data room layout that the customers would prefer you to do all the foundations in one go to avoid vibration later? So, so normally uh, what I've seen, we do the foundation for the complete facility at, yeah. at, at the first step. But then we only build uh, the part of the data center that, that they need today in, in order to uh, don't have those uh, vibrations and uh, maybe impacts. Do you think that one of, the, one of the solutions will win over the other or will we always end up with both bricks and mortar and uh, modular construction? Uh, if you have time uh, and you're in uh, a place where you have a good supply of material and labor, I think it will be more uh, uh, ec economic to build it in a traditional way. Yeah. But in some places, cheaper. Pla cheaper, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but in some places, it's hard to find labor and it's also hard to find uh, material. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, the prefab is, uh, is the better one. So there will be a hybrid there as well. Uh, we will use both of them. And as I said before, we also have combinations of traditional buildings in combination with prefabricated parts of it for plant rooms, uh, yeah, yeah. UPS, the UPS, switchboard. Yeah, I think I think both will carry on for the foreseeable future. But uh, two reasons, you know, one is customers have existing assets, uh, so a lot of them have property which they wish to enhance and upgrade. So, that, um, and secondly, um, that every site is different. So you have, you know, sites are hard to find. Suitable sites are really hard to find. So you have to adapt to your site conditions. Uh, and sometimes the best way to adapt is, uh, you know, prefabricated. 
In other locations, it's a hybrid. In other locations, it's bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we make sure we can deal with whichever's required and is most appropriate to that site. What's going to happen with the, uh, the edge as far as um, reliability is concerned? Are we, are we still going to look at the edge as being a data center that needs uh, precision power and nearly precision cooling? I think so. As, as far as I can see today, uh, I mean, we will still use UPSs, some kind of cooling, uh, there will be redundancy and so on. Uh, so, so I don't think uh, we will reduce that. I think all the applications, the quality is going up. You know, because we as users expect higher quality video. Yes, we notice it, the expectations are higher all the time, not lower. Mm -hmm. So I think the pressure to keep the quality and reliability up will only accelerate which means we're forced to readdress those same issues of you know, how's the power backed up, how's the cooling reliable, you know, what, how's the IT fall over or transfer, you know, all those sort of issues will continue. And, and in your business, do you think this fast rollout of integrated systems, which contain UPS and other things, do you think you'll, you'll uh, offer solutions, complete package solutions for these, for these deployments, or are you still looking to sell it to the people who roll out the solutions? We offer complete solutions. So, the, um, I mean, today we uh, we, we uh, offer complete solutions that includes everything except the servers. You can say, so, so everything from the transform uh, from the transformator all the way into the PDU and the server rack, mm. and and the same thing for cooling and. Well, if you offer a solution, it's usually the client. Most users, when offered a solution, either want it because it's cheaper. But they're going to give you the whole job, so they want it cheaper. Or they want one uh, throat to choke, as they say. They want one. They want to put all their risk into one person that they can then grab hold of. So, for example, a disadvantage for most companies is if they're too big. If the company is too big, it means they can pay when they get sued. Mm -hmm. So, I, I think most of the customers that I speak with today, they want one partner, one one to discuss with. And if something goes wrong. I mean, it's only and that, and that does push you then to offering a solution because yeah. the more you can bundle together, the yes. So I see that as a clear trend. Yeah, we see we we see it as a, a, a I suppose it is a management of risk. It's a collaboration um, with the really the service providers um, to to offer a complete package and also to manage the transition from where they are now. So it's actually a program that has to be managed as well as a solution. So it's solutions with programs uh, for the service providers. We, we additionally have a, a, a reseller division that works with integrators, you mentioned that separately, uh, for enterprises. So the integrators will have their own solution for the enterprises, mm. but Mike and I work with the service providers directly on the, the, the managed program transition, including the solutions required, but also the project management delivery of support, because our clients are you know, focused on a 15-year horizon, and, and you know, not just a, a five-year horizon, maybe for the next change, it's all the changes that are required for the next uh, generation. Yeah, I mean, timescales are certainly getting shorter, aren't they? And payback periods of even five years are now regarded as uh, unviable, but mm. uh, it's a crazy situation. So the industry is very slow to change. Do you think that this revolution, as you call it, that we're, that you're kicking, we're kicking off, this will change the, the, the conservative nature of the industry or will we, okay. we still be no. slow to respond? But part of our role as you know, solution consultants, if you like, is to understand the differences. So the, the, the differences are already there. So we have to understand. So a, a, a co-location cl client has a different perspective on those issues than does a telecom client or a cloud provider or a blockchain or a hyperscale. And we already service all those types of clients. So part of our role is to understand the preferences of each of those and then we alter the solutions to reflect those requirements. Mm -hmm. It's already fact today, I could go through each of them and you know, take you through the difference in their approach. And some are extremely traditional and right through to others which are extremely experimental. Uh, and, and we have all types and we deal with all sorts. Mm -hmm. And I think on the cooling side, I mean, uh, the temperatures there all connects back to ASHRAE and uh, the warranty from the different uh, manufacturers of, of, uh, of uh, hardware. So as long as they don't change that, I mean, I don't think we'll see a rapid change no. of... Uh, so cooling temperatures, you know, from 18C through to 33. Battery life from, from you know, eight hours or, or uh, through to nothing at all uh, are examples of that, you know. Mm. The point about ASHRAE, of course, is that 
um, they've expanded the, 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 the envelope over, over since 2004. They've expanded the envelope a lot. They've done a lot for the industry. They've changed the point of where you measure the temperature and humidity from the crack return to the inlet of the server. But they are the server manufacturers. Yes. They're not an independent body. They, they write standards, that's true, ANSI standards, American national standards, but they are dominated and successfully dominated by the server manufacturers. So you're quite right, you know, the, the ability to get away from that envelope, uh, it, you do it at your own risk. Yes. Definitely do it at your own risk because uh, but, you stay within it. You but because, you know, the industry is getting older now and there's, you know, there's more experience in more countries. So, you know, uh, one of the changes, whether you follow ASHRAE uh, as a leading American interest group or you don't follow ASHRAE is one of the discussions that we would regularly have now. OK, well, I think we've, we've, uh, we've look, looked over the entire uh, data centre industry this morning. Um, I think the three of us agree that uh, there's no one solution that fits all. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of business models out there that, are, that need individual specialization and will have parts of the market that go extremely um, risk uh, dominated and parts of the market will, which will stay completely risk averse. And, and the one that will win um, will be the one that uh, survives. Exactly. Okay, thanks very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Thank you.